he is, but he wrote about it. One of the most beautiful hymns in, in English literature. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath the flood lose all their guilty stains. <coughs> lose all their guilty stains. And then he repeats again, lose all their guilty stains. And then he goes on to speak of, Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Ever since by faith I saw the stream thy flowing wounds supply. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. How sad that from what we know, he wrote this beautiful hymn which captures the biblical idea, but he never figured out how to access that fountain filled with blood. Friends and brethren, we pass this way but once. It is imperative we find out how to get God's forgiveness. Hebrews 9 and verse 27 says that. It's appointed for us once to die, and after that, the judgment. Well, let's just think about what forgiveness is. And the first point of view is that of negatively, what it is not, what it will not do. When we can finally get the forgiveness that was so elusive for men like William Cooper, it will not erase the fact that we have committed sin. Now that's something you wouldn't expect a gospel preacher to emphasize because our job is rightly to take the Bible and show how that when we're forgiven, finally God forgets. And of course He does. But the objective fact out there in the history of the world in space-time history will always exist that we have committed those things that we should not. In 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15, Paul seems to allude to that when he spoke of how that Christ had shown mercy to him, but he was the chief of sinners. He was the chief in that he had sinned so horrifically against the church of God. So I won't erase the fact that I've sinned. If I do something wrong, I can be forgiven. But the fact I did it wrong will always be a fact with its consequences as we shall see. Secondly, when we get forgiveness biblically, it won't blot out all memory of sin. Now on God's part, we will see that it does. But not on our part because we're human. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, we read of the uh, terrible story of David in a moment of great weakness, the king of Israel, who rather than going out with his troops to fight in the season of battle, stayed back and in his time of idleness looked out and saw a woman and in her physical beauty lusted after her, Bathsheba, took her unto himself, had her husband Uriah the Hittite killed. And because of that, many consequences followed throughout all of his life. His whole life was really messed up from that point. Though he was forgiven. But he was ever aware of it. In fact, in one of the great Psalms that he wrote about in Psalm 51 verses 3 and 4, he says, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this great wickedness, he said to God. He could never really forget it. Nor, as we've mentioned, did the temporal consequences of it. Thirdly, disappear. They followed, though David was, in fact, forgiven. Paul would write many centuries later, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Galatians 6 and in verse 7. So while one can be forgiven, let's just take a very simple example we've used many times. The, the intoxicated person, the drunk, who gets behind the wheel of an automobile and illegally drives down the road, smashes into another car and kills an innocent person, can never undo the damage that was done, though could be forgiven based upon repentance. A man who kills his wife in a fit of rage can never undo what he's done, though he could be forgiven of that. Uh, one, a young person or even an older person involved in immorality, in a sexual sin, sex outside of marriage, uh, could face the consequences throughout his or her life. An unwanted pregnancy that he or she has to deal with as a result, a socially transmitted disease, the loss of virginity, and just the fact just the fact that it has happened, though, can be forgiven. And forgiveness will not do away with the fact, nor with the memory, nor with the consequences, nor even, brothers and sisters, will it do away with our appetite to sin from time to time. In Colossians 3 and verse 5, Paul found it necessary to tell us, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Talking about our physical desires. Mortify literally means to put to death but not literally in the context. He doesn't say commit suicide, literally. 
He's saying, cause those members which are alive unto sin to cease to be alive to sinful things. And he goes on to give specifics. Fornication, which of course means sexual immorality. Uncleanness. Inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Of course, evil concupiscence is evil desire. And those things we are to try to mortify because, as Paul himself said, I buffet my body daily, 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 27. I keep under my body, the King James says, and bring it into subjection, lest I myself, after having preached to others, should become a castaway. Even Paul recognized that Though he had been forgiven and entrusted with this great task of being an apostle to the Gentiles and, and saving so many souls could have so sinned if he hadn't been careful that he could have lost his standing with God. So negatively, it doesn't do away with the fact or memory or consequences or even desire for sin. So then what does forgiveness do when it finally occurs? Well, it saves from the eternal consequence of sin. And that is death. Romans 6 and verse 23. That death is the second death, Revelation 20 and verse 14. It saves a soul from death when one is forgiven, as we as his instruments can help do in the church. When we go find an erring brother, we bring him back. James 5 verses 19 and 20 says we cover a multitude of sins and we save a soul from death. Forgiveness is where the means whereby we are reconciled. To God, reconcile. We use that word in everyday parlance. We refer to the fact there may be enmity or tension between two parties, two persons. But when reconciliation takes place, the enmity is gone away. We were once enemies because of sin, but then we get forgiveness. And in Ephesians 2 and verse 11 and following, the record says, Wherefore remember, brethren, that ye in times past being Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For... He is our peace that hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make of himself of twain one new man so making peace, and that he might reconcile, verse 16, both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. So that's why he would say in 2 Corinthians 5 and in verse 20, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Why the need for reconciliation? It's not because God left us. It's because we turned away from God. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither His ear heavy that He cannot hear. But your sins have separated between you and your God, and your iniquities have hidden His face from you that He will not hear. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. Speaking about uh, English authors, a number of years ago an American author, Henry David Thoreau, very well known today even, had been approached by someone as he was contemplating his death who asked him, Sir, have you been reconciled to God? And he just smugly said back, Well, I didn't know we had quarreled. Of course, he was not noted for any faith in true Christianity, uh, one of the transcendentalists of, of New England. And, and it reflected in this very deficient view of where we stand as mature adults. We have sinned against God we have quarreled against him, as it were. We have sinned, and Thoreau, therefore, was totally mistaken by making this silly quip. So there's a need. Thoreau didn't see it, but we need to be reconciled. But why is there such a need? Some in, in the theological world around us, some in, in our own country, many around us would say, well, it's because we've inherited you know, the guilt of Adam's original sin. Adam sinned, and when he did, he passed on the guilt to all of mankind, all of his posterity. But so much in Scripture belies that point of view. And for example, in Matthew 19 and verse 14, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. We are to become as little children, he says in Matthew 18, 1 to 4. Ezekiel 18, 1 to 4. Well, all, all of the 18th chapter of Ezekiel, really, uh, has is this message 
The uh, son shall not inherit the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father inherit the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. So we know that this whole idea of the inheritance of guilt is wrong. Incidentally, while I'm on this point, this is just an aside. Often in churches of Christ, we are compared to others in the, in the religious world, in the Protestant world, who are known as Armenians. In, con in contrast to the Calvinists. Now the Calvinists following John Calvin would have pushed hard for this earlier idea of Augustine, or Augustine as he's pronounced, that we do inherit guilt. Uh, all the way down the line, guilt is transmitted from father to son. Even though Ezekiel the prophet says, it is not. Well, Calvin figured out you're wrong. It is too, he argued with an inspired man of God. Now, the Ar Jacob Arminius modified that a little bit and, and came to say, well, yes, Original sin is transmitted. But here's what happens. In Christ, every baby that is born, while born with guilt, is instantaneously given uh, uh, this opportunity to be in Christ. So the baby would have been born in guilt, but is born in Christ. Now that's the real Armenian point of view. Uh, we're not in that position, by the way, in churches of Christ. We're not really Armenian. We're more uh, semi-Pelagian.